Well, good morning again, and a special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. So a number of years ago, Becky and I were invited to a friend's house for dinner, and as I walked into their house, it was the first time we'd ever been in their home, we walked through the kitchen, and I was just admiring the work that had been done on the kitchen. I was like, this looks really new. It looks like you guys had renovated your kitchen and done all sorts of things, and the, the husband of this couple immediately said, thanks, yeah, I, I did it all myself. And I was like, really? And then he took me through the house. He took me to the bathroom. I, I love this. Becky says that sometimes when I go to new people's homes, I like snoop through their house. Like, what does your house look like? And so he took me through the, the house and he showed me the bathrooms because he had redone those. I'm like, wow, you really did all of this on your own? I mean, at that point, I could barely hang a picture without like something terribly going wrong with a little house project. He's like, yeah, I did it all myself. And so a couple months go by and I just start telling him about this project that I'm going to do in our house. We had this guest room that used to be two rooms, and the previous owner took out the middle wall and made it one big room. And so we were on the verge of having another child, and I said, we, we're going to need that extra bedroom, so I'm going to put that wall back up. And I was just talking to him about, it, about that, and he's like, have you ever done that before? I'm like, no, never have. He's like, would you like some help? I was like, yes, I would love some. Like secretly, like the reason I was telling him was hoping that he would offer to help. And he's like, yeah, happy to help. It would be a piece of cake. I mean, I looked at his kitchen. It's like, if you can do all that, you should be able to like put up a wall with your eyes closed. So he shows up the day before we're supposed to start the project. And he's just dropping off supplies. He's dropping off all his tools. He just happened to be in the area. And he comes in and he puts this bucket down. And I'm like, what's that? It's like, oh, it's, it's my, my toolbox. It's a bucket, and it had this, like, this wrap thing around it, and you could organize all your tools, and you could put tools in it. And he's like, it's just easier. The tools are easy to see. They're more accessible. You don't have to like, open it and pull out the tray. It's just all right there. And so we lived right around the corner from Home Depot. Like Literally, you could walk there where we lived in that place. And when he left, I immediately went to Home Depot, and I bought one. <laughs> I still have it. And like when he showed up the next day, he kind of chuckled. He's like, you, you went and bought that last night. I was like, uh-huh, I did. <laughs> and then he pulled, put on a, like a tool belt and it had little compartments and it looked like cool and fancy. And I looked at that and like after he left that day, I went back to Home Depot and I bought that same tool belt. And he came back the next day. He's like, okay, I see what you're doing. But, but really, like I was trying to mimic him because what I saw was I saw this skill that he had. And I was thinking to myself, how can I acquire that same skill? What do I need to do? How do I imitate him in hopes that maybe what's true of him will also be true of me? So we finished the project. It went well. And then I got to know him more and more. And as the months went by, I started to have a reality check on what it would mean to mimic this friend of mine. Because uh, it was a random Wednesday. We were out to lunch. The server comes to, order, comes to take our drink order, um, and he orders a beer, which is fine. No big deal. Orders like this huge stein of a beer. It comes and sets it down. He starts to drink it. Okay, no big deal. He finished it before like they came back to take our order for lunch, and then he ordered another one. And I was like, oh, he has a drinking problem is what he has. And then through that conversation, I learned that he had a second job as a bartender in the evenings, and he would stay after work and drink. And then I started to learn, not only does he have a drinking problem, but he has an anger problem. And I started to discover all these things his wife was doing to cover up both his drinking problem and his anger problem. One day we were invited over to their house. He was not there. He was working. And his wife was changing outdoors in their hallway into the bedroom. And I was like, what happened there that you're changing outdoors? And she made up some story, and I was like, okay, no big deal. Turns out he had like punched a hole through the door and just hadn't gotten around to changing it, and she knew people were coming over and tried to do it herself. And so over the course of the next couple of months, I realized it's not me who needs to learn from him, but I need to come alongside and help him so he doesn't destroy his marriage and ruin his life. See, at first glance, there were things about his life that I admired and I wanted to imitate. But as I got deeper into his life, I realized, ah, maybe not so much. And the thing that I'm wondering this morning is whether or not at any level that's true of our lives. Meaning, at first glance, maybe our lives look great. Maybe we're really good at projecting the way things are going. But if people were to really spend time with us, 
and get to know us, would they want to imitate our lives? That's the question for us this morning. Would anyone want to imitate your life? And not the life that you project, but the life that you truly lead when no one else is watching. And our passage today speaks to this issue and names specifically what makes a life, a life in Christ, worth imitating. And this is how our passage begins. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Paul writes, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. Now, all of Paul's letters fit within the narrative of his missionary journeys. Paul took three missionary journeys. You can find them all recorded in the book of Acts. And the approach to his journeys is that he would show up to a new city. He would go into the Jewish synagogue. He would preach the gospel there. He would gather whoever are intrigued or responding to his message, and he would start to gather them regularly. Over time, he would establish them as their own church, and then he would move on to another city and do that same thing again. And so Paul comes to the town of Thessalonica in his second journey. You can see on this map where it's located in Macedonia throughout the Roman Empire, which is that star up on the top left corner of the map. That's where he comes, preaches the gospel, and you can find that story in Acts 17, verses 1 through 9. And then after a few months, he, a few weeks actually, he, he moves on. Now, the reason, for, for Paul, the reason why Paul writes the majority of his letters is usually to correct something in a church, right? Maybe it's correcting false teaching, Maybe it's correcting conflict or division that's in the church. Or maybe it's uh, addressing infiltrators who have come into the church from outside to stir up trouble. But the reason Paul writes 1 Thessalonians is because he had a short stay in Thessalonica that ended with an abrupt exit. See, it wasn't unusual for Paul to stay in a certain city for a long time. Like he spent a year and a half in Corinth. It says that he spent over two years in Ephesus, but in Thessalonica, maybe at most he spends one month. We're told in Acts 17 that on three Sabbaths, so for three weeks, he went to a Jewish synagogue to preach. So we know he was there at least three weeks. It may have been a little bit more, but it doesn't seem to be much beyond that. And while he was there, he preached the gospel. So many people are responding to the gospel. It causes a stir in the city, and it actually incites a riot. Again, you can read this in Acts 17. That a a group of people, a mob, it says, went to the house of some guy named Jason. Because apparently this mob thought that Paul and his companions were staying with Jason. So they go to his house to find Paul and his buddies. And they aren't there. So they grab Jason. And they take Jason to the ruling authorities in Thessalonica. And it says that these men, speaking of Jason and Paul and his companion, they've caused trouble all over the world and now they're here. It says they're defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there's another king, one called Jesus. And when they heard this, the crowd and the city and the officials were thrown into turmoil. Huge uproar, riots all throughout the city. So Paul has to make an emergency exit. He leaves in the middle of the night to move on so that his life wouldn't be in danger and hopefully the riot and challenge for the Christians who were there would start to quell and calm down. So Paul doesn't write 1 Thessalonians necessarily to correct anything wrong in the church. Rather, he writes 1 Thessalonians to fill in the gaps of things that he wasn't able to teach before he was forced out. Out. There are things that he didn't get to that he needs to communicate to them. Now, before he gets to that, though, he spends the first part of this book doing what he normally does, a customary beginning by giving thanks and praying. He says in verse 2, We always thank God for all of you, continually mentioning you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith. Now, you might expect Paul to open his letter talking about their character or maybe some spiritual growth that had occurred in them during his time there. He kind of opens that way when you read the book of Colossians. He says, we thank God that the gospel is bearing fruit 
in you. We're asking that you would be filled with the knowledge and the wisdom of God. We're praying that you would live a life worthy of the calling you received. You would think maybe he would start this letter in that way, but instead he talks about their work ethic. And apparently, as a church, they are a really hard-working church. Because not only does he say, we thank God for your work produced by faith, he says, and we thank God for your labor prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus. And there's something really inspiring about hard work and determination There's something really inspiring about somebody who has the odds stacked against them, but they work, 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 and they overcome those odds to go on and do great things. I don't know if anybody here knows who Steve Harvey is, right? Kind of like a a man about TV, mustache man, maybe some people call him. He's got this giant mustache. Um, Steve Harvey might be one of the hardest working men in show business. Over the last couple years, he has had three TV shows that he films and a morning radio show that he films. He does all of it. And recently I came across a YouTube video of him talking about what his daily schedule is like. And basically this is what he does every day of the week. He wakes up at 4.30 in the morning. He says at five at the latest. Spends a little bit of time in reflection and quiet to start his day. He's got a studio, his radio studio is in his house, so from six in the morning to 10 in the morning, he's doing a live radio show every day of the week. He's on Zoom and doing it virtually and digitally, but it's this broadcast show that I think is based out of LA. He lives in Atlanta, I think. And then right from there, he goes to his home gym and he works out for 30 to 40 minutes max, he says. And then from there, he's getting driven to the studio where he's got to film his shows, and by 11.30, he arrives at the studio and starts to get prepped to film his first of three shows of the day. He films that from 11.30 to 3.30, takes an hour and a half break to eat something from 3.30 to 5, goes back to film his second show of the day from 5 to 7, takes a 30-minute break to eat something again. And you've got to believe his meetings are pro- or his breaks are probably full of meetings and people trying to get him dialed into whatever else is going on in his life. Because not only does he do these shows, like he hosts all kinds of award shows and things. And then he films his third show of the day from 7.30 to 9, then starts to make his way home. And he's home by 10 and does that the very next day. And what makes it so inspiring to see somebody work so hard was that early on in his career, like he was living out of his car. He was homeless for three years, taking showers in hotels whenever he could maybe get a hotel room, just trying to make ends meet, doing comedy and stand-up stuff. And he worked and he worked and he worked and still works and works and works, but is wildly successful. Meaning you never hear the story, an inspiring story about somebody who dropped out of college, who lives in their parents' basement, sleeps till noon, plays video games all day, and is just eking their way through life. Like, we don't hear stories of that and be like, ah, that makes me want to go and do great things, right? But when we hear stories of people who work hard, who are determined, who want to overcome the odds, it makes us think like, yeah, I can do that as well. Now, what Paul is talking about here, though, with their work isn't that they have some career path or they're trying to climb the corporate ladder. He says, we're thanking God for your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, your endurance inspired by hope. What he's doing is he's talking about their work in ministry, specifically how they are motivated by the mission of God. They are a group of people that is motivated by mission because Paul roots their work not in some success success path, but he roots their work in the well-known triad of faith, hope, and love, showing how their work is rooted in God's work to bring faith, hope, and love to the entire world. And the reason why they are motivated by the mission of God and motivated by faith, hope, and love is because they are people who have been recipients of it. They've been on the receiving end of God's mission in the world, specifically to them in their city. Because Paul will go on to say in verse 4, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. 
Paul says, we know that you have received all that God has for you because he has chosen you. And there's something really overwhelming and humbling about the realization that God wants you. Have you ever thought of that before? Uh, lately, our daughter Emma has been asking me, Dad, do you like me? And I go, no, I love you. Like she wants to know that she's loved. And then I follow it up with like, and I like you too, right? Like she wants to know that she's loved. There's something that is just, oh, in our heart about wanting to be known, wanting to be seen, wanting to be chosen. And the God of the universe sees you. He knows you. He knows your circumstances. He knows your resistance to him, but he is relentless in his pursuit of you. He's even patient with you when you resist, when you disobey. He keeps coming and he says, you are mine. I love and like you. That was true for the church in Thessalonica. It's true for us as well. It's that God has chosen you. Verse 5, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, in deep conviction. See, what's interesting about verse 4 and verse 5 is there's a subtle shift in who or what Paul is talking about, right? It's clear in verse 2 and 3, he's talking about the Thessalonians. We're thanking God for your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope. But then in verse 4, he starts to talk about the things he did when he arrived in Thessalonica. And so as you're reading these first few verses, it's like, wait a minute, who is Paul talking about? Is he talking about them? Or is he talking about himself? Because he seems to be naming the work that he did in Thessalonica when he arrived, namely preaching of the gospel. And essentially what Paul is starting to show with these verses is that the things that are true of the Thessalonian church are also true of himself. Because not only is the church in Macedonia motivated by the mission of God, Paul too is motivated by the mission of God. And not only are they and he motivated by the mission of God, they are also compelled by conviction. Did you catch that at the end of verse 5? He said, our, our gospel came to you with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. Paul also has conviction. See, see, the reason people work hard at something is because they develop a belief about their work that it has significant impact in their life, in the world, and other people's Lives. The reason somebody works hard at something is because they have a deep belief about it. And the deep belief that Paul and the church in Thessalonica has developed, the conviction that they've developed is that the gospel is the power of God. Paul will say this in, in Romans 1. He says, like, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Like, I'm convicted by the gospel because it is the power of God for everyone who believes? See, the narrative of our culture is that hustle and hard work make things happen. To some extent, that's true. In our faith, it can be counterintuitive. It's not always hustle and hard work that makes things happen, but it's surrender and letting go. Hustle and hard work in our culture, yes, make things happen. That's why Steve Harvey is successful. He worked 16-hour days. He slept in his car when he had to. He did all the things so he could make a name for himself. In our faith, not so much. In our faith, it's about surrender. It's about submission. It's about relinquishing control and opening your life to the gospel because it is the power of God for everyone who believes. See, the narrative of the gospel is that we are people who are in great need. You have great need in your life. Paul will say in other letters, like, I'm the chief among sinners. Like the, the, the narrative of the gospel is that we are sinners saved by God's grace, by his power. 
that God through Christ is in the process of making all things new, that includes you and me. We are people who need to be made new. And what grace does is grace changes you. Grace isn't just something that wipes away your sin. It's God's power in your life to make you new. Because when you experience grace, like it changes your perspective on so many things. A while back I heard, I was, I don't know if anybody actually listens to the radio, like actual like AM, FM radio in your car. Every once in a while I, li- I just listen to the radio. What's on the radio? And I happened to catch this segment as I was driving into work one day about stories of days at work that were just really bad. You know, like everybody has like everything went wrong at work. It was like one disaster after another. And so the radio host would say, call in and tell us your story of how you had a really bad day at work. So this guy calls in and he was a server at Olive Garden at the time. He said it was Mother's Day and it was around lunch and the restaurant was just packed. It was slammed. People waiting out the door, every table, every seat full. And he's taken an order from a family that's obviously there for a Mother's Day lunch. And he comes back, the dad orders a glass of red wine. And so he brings it. And as he's giving the dad the wine, he spills the glass of wine all down the front of his shirt, wearing a white like button-up shirt, looking nice for Mother's Day, spills the entire glass of wine down the guy's shirt, and he is mortified. He said for the rest of the meal, every time he went back to the table, he is reminded visually by the mistake that he made. And he offers to, hey, send me the dry cleaning bill. I will fix it. Hey, send me whatever it costs to buy you a brand new shirt. I will fix it. Throughout the meal, he's just mortified. He's certain that by the end of that meal, he is going to have like a $2 tip or a zero tip. Like he's not expecting anything. The family pays their check. They leave the receipt on the table. He goes to pick up the bill. He said, what was the, the worst day ended up being the best day because I got a $50 tip from that guy after dumping a glass of red wine all down his shirt. Like, that's grace. Grace is lavished on us. Like, like, in terms of the illustration, we are the people who dump the wine, right? We're the people who make the mess. We're the ones who make the mistake. But yet God, through his grace, his goodness, and his sovereignty, has paid the bill and given us more on top of it. When you receive that into your life, when you have the ability to humble yourself and say, okay, I'll take that, it has the power to change your life, to change your perspective about everything you know to be true, one about who God is and who you are and how God works in your life. And so what Paul is saying here is that a life worth imitating is a life that's motivated by the mission of God, compelled by the conviction that the gospel is the power of God and all of this results from transformation. Meaning once you have experienced all of that and you see your life starting to change, that's when you get compelled by the conviction of the gospel being the power of God. That's when it motivates you to engage in the mission of God. That we can engage in the mission of God wherever we are doing whatever we're called to do because God is everywhere doing all sorts of things and Engaging in the mission of God is simply partnering with him of his work in the world. And what people want to know, what a watching world wants to know, is the question of, is your faith real? Like, do you really believe what you say you believe? Like, do you actually order your life in that way? Or do you project something when people are watching, but behind closed doors you live a radically different way. People want to know, does what you say you believe actually have an effect on your life? Does it actually change the way you operate? Does it actually change your your values and your priorities? Or are you just doing it for some self-help actualization, get out of jail free card so I can get to heaven when I die? Or does it actually impact the way you live in the here and now? And what the church in Thessalonica saw in Paul is that it was real. That what he believed was real. 
They saw someone who was motivated by the mission of God, who was sacrificing his entire life, going to the ends of the earth to do the things that God has called him to do. Somebody who was compelled by conviction because it was a result of his transformation. If you read Acts 9, the story of him breathing down murderous threats against the church, trying to stomp out the movement that Jesus started at his resurrection and ascension, and he was accosted by the gospel, by a vision of God, knocked flat on the ground, was blind for three days. And in that moment, it was like, okay, God, this is for real. Changed his life and was compelled, was motivated to go work for the sake of the kingdom. He says in 1 Corinthians 15 that God's grace to me was not without effect. I am what I am only because of the grace of God. He goes on to say, I worked harder than any of the other apostles, but not I, but God through his grace working in me. When you experience a transformation through the power of the gospel, it compels you to be convicted that it's something to work at and it motivates you to engage in his mission. And so in turn, the those in Thessalonica saw that in Paul's life, and what they did was they imitated him. It says this, second half of verse 5, you know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. He said, you became imitators of us. Now, imitation can be viewed in, in different ways. There's different levels of of imitation. The first one is imitation as a knockoff, meaning you see something that you like and you make a copy of it, trying to emulate it, but you haven't put the work into really doing it or learning the skill, and so it doesn't look all that great. And it's just kind of like, eh. Imitation crab would be one of those things. <laughs> would be one of those things. Like, imitation crab is terrible. It's like there's no real crab in it. You, you can watch how they make it online. It starts with seafood paste. It, and it looks like this big vat of glue that they're stirring around. It's bright white. And then they take some of that and they put red food dye in it, like blood red. And it looks gross. And then they dump that deep red paste back into the big vat of white paste to make it pink. And then they lay it out and thin it out in sheets and roll it up and layer it over like, oh, like, I don't know why anybody would be like, I'm going to go get myself some imitation crab for dinner tonight, right? Because nobody does. In order to eat imitation crab, it has to be hidden in other things. Like, there's a good chance if you're eating crab rangoon, like, it's imitation crab. It's not real crab. But you don't care. Like it's deep fried. It's got cream cheese. All Like you don't, like you could care less because it's hidden in something else. If you go to Metro Market on Mondays and buy sushi because it's only $5, you're probably eating imitation crab in the sushi there, which I do from time to time. You know, whatever. But, but the point is like it has to be hidden to cover up that it's not that good. There's imitation that tries to be a knockoff of something else. And then there's imitation where you see somebody's skill and you're like, oh, I want that, right? It's the imitation of somebody's skill and ability. When I first started preaching, I discovered Tim Keller. And during seminary, I listened to nothing but Tim Keller for weeks and months and years on end, every day listening to one of his sermons. When I started to preach in my first role, somebody came up to me and they're like, you remind me of Tim Keller. And I was like, yeah, I do, yeah, right? <laughs> Tim Keller and me, like we hang and run in the same circles. Uh, and as I step back from that compliment, I'm like, really what I'm doing is I'm just a copycat. Like he was the first layer in my preaching foundation to build on. And I, I did, I, I mimicked so much of his style because I didn't know what my own style was. I saw something that I liked and I just started to mimic it. So that's another level of imitation. But then there's the level of imitation where you see somebody's character. You see their life. You see their priorities and their values and the way that they treat people. You see their work ethic. You see that they don't have like anxiety and worry driving their life, that they're generous with what they have, that they're able to lower themselves and not always need credit. And you're like, ah, there's something there in them 
that I want. Uh, if you were here at our Good Friday service, I was saying on Good Friday that I've been watching The Chosen lately and been enthralled with it, specifically the way that they are portraying the person of Jesus. And I said on that Friday night that I've actually become smitten with Jesus as portrayed in The Chosen. I'm like, oh man, look at that guy. Wow. Like almost to say like, not only would I want to be friends with him, and I found myself thinking like, I hope Jesus is actually like that. And then I think to myself, he's actually probably better than that. But I find myself thinking like, I want to be like that. Like that's the type of person I want to be. I want to be consistent in my character, in my care for people, in my priorities, in the way that I can understand who God is and what he has called me to and have conviction for it. And so the question is, when it comes to imitation, how are you pursuing imitation when it comes to your own spiritual life? Are you just trying to be somebody who's a knockoff in what you see other people doing in the church? Are you just mimicking what you think people's performance, their spiritual performance is? Or are you really getting to the heart of who God is and seriously saying, like, how do I become that person? And here's what starts to happen. When your character is formed in deep and profound ways, and when it's evident that you really believe what you say you believe, and when you live in a way that's countercultural to the world, and when a whole community of people do that, the world takes notice of it. The world sees it and starts to talk about it. And that's what Paul says next in verse 7. He says, you imitated us, and so you became a model. To all the believers in Macedonia and Ikea, the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Ikea, but your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. See, by imitating the life they saw in Paul and taking hold of it, their life was changed. And at the center of it was the gospel, the power of God. And then Paul goes on to say, this is what people are actually saying about you. Not only about the reception you gave us, but they tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. See, in, in the ancient world, there were shrines and statues that were attached to other gods. And people would pledge their allegiance to these shrines and statues and these other gods. And they did it all the time for measures of security and safety. Thinking, if I offer this sacrifice to this god through this idol, like some sort of blessing or provision will come my way. And Paul's saying they've turned from that, a countercultural move to say we're rejecting that and we're giving our allegiance to the true God, the true king of the world. And the reality of our lives is we all have idols in our lives. Maybe they're not little shrines and statues that we prop up on our mantle, but we all look to things in our life that if I have that, if I pursue that, if I acquire that, I will have safety, security, and significance in my life. And the call, the way we start the transformation process, if we want to really be people who have a life worth imitating, the way that we begin that transformation process is turning from the idols in our life to God. It's what the Bible calls repentance. It's a changing of heart. It's a changing of mind. It's a changing of direction. It's a change of allegiance to say, this is the direction I'm headed because I know that in this, in God, in his gospel, there's power for my life to be made new. And so the question is, how do you know when something is an idol in your life? Well, it's when you think of your life without that thing, and it just makes you scared and afraid. Like, if I don't have that, I'm not safe, I'm not secure, I'm not a somebody. And the way that you can tell that you're loosening your grip on something that might be an idol is through the question of, like, if it goes away, you can be okay. I don't know anything about Steve Harvey apart from the shows he films and the work schedule that he has. But somebody who works like that, you got to wonder, like, what's driving that, right? What's driving that sort of schedule is there some sort of safety, security, or significance that he's searching that if those things were to go away, would he feel like he's a somebody, not a somebody, 
and not have any sense of identity. This is a, a, a man named Adam LaRoche, and he used to be a baseball player for the Chicago White Sox. And he abruptly quit his team and quit baseball, I think it was around 2016, and just said, I'm done with the sport. The reason being was the White Sox told him not to bring his son, that's his son in the picture, around the clubhouse anymore. His son would come with him to practice, would shag balls, would do things, he'd be around, and the White Sox said, don't bring your son anymore. He's like, okay, then I'm going to be done playing baseball. He walked away from a $13 million salary that year to not only spend time with his son, but also to go do work in Southeast Asia to help victims of human trafficking. And when you read up on him, you find that he has a devout faith in the Lord. Did he love playing baseball? Yes. Did he work hard at it? Yes. But at the end of the day, it wasn't who he was. He wasn't first and foremost a baseball player. He was a follower of Jesus who was a dad second. And when I look at that, I'm like, that's courage. Like, that's guts. That's somebody who has conviction and motivation about the mission of God. And he's somebody I would want to imitate. And so the question is for us, is that true of us? And the way that we start that path is through repentance. It's through turning from the things in our world that we think bring us safety, security, and significance. And we recognize how they're bankrupt to do that. And we go to God. And we go to him. Because a life worthy of imitation starts with transformation. Not through hard work and hustle, but through submission and surrender and putting ourselves at the feet of Jesus to say, it's you and you alone that I need. So may your life be open to the power of the gospel. May your life become worthy of imitation. And may the work that God is doing in you, just like it was in Thessalonica, become known to everyone everywhere in our community. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. We recognize, Lord, again, our need for you in our lives. We ask that you would help us see where are the idols in our lives that are vying for our affection or in our attention. And may we do the necessary things to turn from them, to go to you, to say it's in you and you alone, in your gospel, in your power, in your grace, that we find the life we want and that we could be the people who you have called us to be. And so, Lord, we submit ourselves. We surrender ourselves. We, we open ourselves to you this morning to say it is through you your death and your resurrection, that we are fully made whole. And so may we open ourselves up to that. Amen.